Good morning. War Eagle. I know y'all don't hear that very often up here. Well, on behalf of the Auburn University President, Dr. Stephen Leith, and the Auburn University Board of Trustees, I'd like to welcome each and every one of you here this morning. I would also like to thank George Washington University for allowing us to use this venue for this morning. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the 2019 State of Homeland Security Address by Secretary Nielsen. The opportunity to facilitate this important discussion is a real privilege. Thank you for being here. And more importantly, thank you, Secretary Nielsen, for taking time out of your schedule to join us. My colleague, Frank Salefo, is director of Auburn University's McCrary Institute for Cyber and Critical Infrastructure Security and our Center for Cyber and Homeland Security. He has hosted Secretary Nielsen and each of her predecessors for this event since the department was created. We are lucky to have him at the helm of the McCrary Institute. The McCrary Institute uses research and scholarship to develop practical solutions for real world problems. The Institute's mission is to fuse theory with practice and policy with technology to protect and advance U.S. interest in the areas of cyber and critical infrastructure security. He approaches solutions and he designs those to enhance security across the public and private sectors. The Institute's policy work is driven by the Center for Cyber and Homeland Security based here in Washington, D.C. The Center is a nonpartisan think tank that develops innovative ideas and solutions to current and future threats to the United States. It accomplishes its mission by convening events such as this one, by publishing policy relevant analysis, and by providing expert testimony to Congress on critical issues and challenges that are related to cybersecurity, critical infrastructure, counterterrorism, and homeland security. Together, the Institute and the Center help advance Auburn's mission and our ambition to be a national leader in cyber, infrastructure, and homeland security. They also innovate in those areas that matter most. Turning now, though, this morning to Secretary Nielsen, it is my honor to introduce her. She was sworn in as the sixth Secretary of Homeland Security in December of, in December of 2017. She previously served as White House Deputy Chief of Staff. She joined the Trump administration in January of 2017 as Chief of Staff to then Secretary of Homeland Security, John Kelly. In that position, she advised the Secretary on all operational, policy, and legal matters, including counterterrorism, cyberterrorism, cybersecurity, and border security. Secretary Nielsen has also served in the private sector, focusing on a range of homeland and national security matters, including preparedness strategies and policies to prevent, protect against, and respond to catastrophic events with a focus on critical infrastructure and interdependencies that go with that. In 2004, she was commissioned by President Bush to serve as a special assistant to the President for Prevention, Preparedness, and Response on the White House Homeland Security Council, where her responsibilities included the development, coordination, and oversight of U.S. government homeland security policy. She has also served as the chair of the World Economic Forum's Global Agenda Council on Risk and Resilience. She is an attorney by training, and in past, she has served as a senior fellow with the Center for Cyber and Homeland Security. In other words, she has walked the walk in many different facets that we will talk about today. Please join me in welcoming our moderator, Frank Salefo, and Secretary. Well, thank you, General. I will be exceedingly brief. Uh, I, I think you covered all the bases. Uh, let me just uh, echo your comments and say it is a true privilege to be able to host Secretary Nielsen again here on campus. She's a rock star, we know that, uh, and she's got one of the most difficult jobs, I think, uh, in the U.S. government. 
or even beyond the U.S. government. And, and just given uh, last week's events in, in Christchurch, you can see that the threat is consistently morphing, changing, um, but uh, privileged to have a, a secretary like Secretary Nielsen at the helm during these difficult times. So bottom line, um, uh, Madam Secretary, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you for uh, coming back on campus, and I look forward to moderating a Q&A with you afterwards. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you to uh, General Burgess, and congratulations on the championship. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that. I could not be more grateful to you and to Frank for your leadership uh, in public service. And I'd like to start really quickly by us giving them both a round of applause. So thank you to them. I'd also like to thank the Auburn Center for Cyber and Homeland Security and George Washington University for hosting me here today. So before I begin, uh, much like Frank, you know I can go on and on and on on these topics, so I'm going to try to limit it, but I do want to cover uh, what has changed and where we're headed. So I want to also extend my appreciation to the many friends, colleagues, and distinguished guests joining us today. In this room are men and women who have built the Department of Homeland Security from the ground up. Others who have followed in their footsteps by taking up the call to service, and others who support our missions by executing theirs so well. So thank you all for being here today. We're gathered here today at a pivotal moment. Life is changing faster than at any point in human history. And as a nation, we face a choice. Shape the world around us or be shaped by it. We cannot hide from the future. If we do, history will judge us harshly. That is why today it is my duty to report that although the overall security of the homeland is strong, the threats we face are graver than any time since September 11, 2001. The ground beneath our feet has shifted. Our enemies and adversaries have evolved. And the arms of government are simply swinging too slowly to protect the American people. Let me be clear, we are more secure than ever against the dangers of the last decade, but we are less prepared than ever for those that will find us in the next. That is why under this president and during this administration, we have made a decision to shape the world around us, to create an environment that is favorable to US interest, to put America's security first, and to dramatically enhance the way we defend the homeland. In short, we are going from being highly reactive to highly resilient, and we are not wasting any time. In fact, last year, I used this platform to announce a policy of relentless resilience at DHS. Today, I am pleased to say we are implementing that agenda at breakneck speed. In the past 12 months, there has been more change at DHS than any single year in its history. This morning, I will tell you what we have accomplished, where we are going, and why it matters. I will preview our bold new strategic plan by walking you through a few of the department's overarching goals. DHS was created to fight one primary generation-defining struggle, the war on terror. But we now find ourselves defending against emerging threats on new battlegrounds. Not only are we still facing the insidious threat from global jihadists, but we are under siege from transnational criminals, faceless cyber thugs and hackers, and resurgent nation state rivals. The battle state is constantly in flux, flipping from the physical world to the virtual world and then back again, all in the blink of an eye. Today, I am more worried about the ability of bad guys to hijack our networks than their ability to hijack our flights. And I am concerned about them holding our infrastructure hostage, stealing our money and secrets, exploiting children online, and even hacking our very democracy. These aren't wars that we can fight in slow motion through meetings, memos, and endless discussions. If we don't anticipate, adapt, and move quickly, we will lose, period. The idea that we can prevail with so-called whole-of-government efforts is now an outdated concept. It's not enough. We need a whole-of-society approach to overcome today's threats. Why? Because it's not just U.S. troops and government agents on the front lines anymore. 
It's U.S. companies. It's our schools and gathering places. It's ordinary, everyday Americans. Threat actors are mercilessly targeting everyone's devices and networks. They are compromising, co-opting, and controlling them. And they're weaponizing, they're weaponizing our own innovation against us. America is not prepared for this. Your average private citizen or company is simply no match against a nation state such as China, Iran, North Korea, or Russia. It's not a fair fight. And until now, our government has done far too little to back them up. President Trump has made Homeland Security his number one priority. Not number two, three, or four. It's pillar one of the U.S. national security strategy. And as Secretary of Homeland Security, I am running with that mandate to obtain the resources to secure the authorities and to execute the changes we need to fully transform Homeland Security and give the American people the protection they deserve. Towards that end, our new, our new DHS strategic plan integrates our mission across agencies and offices to reflect a unified approach, no longer mired in the individual authorities of a given component. The first goal is to combat terrorism and homeland threats. Our department was built in response to a complex, coordinated, and catastrophic terrorist plot. And we continue to do all we can to ensure we know who is traveling to the U.S. and to prevent nefarious actors from carrying out attacks on the homeland. To thwart terrorist plotting, DHS has recently put in place some of the most sweeping security enhancements in a decade. We have instituted tougher vetting and tighter screening in the travel system to prevent terrorists from infiltrating the United States, in addition to instituting the biggest aviation security enhancements in years. This includes sophisticated measures to detect concealed explosives and insider threats. This year, our new National Vetting Center will become fully operational. It will fuse law enforcement data and intelligence from across the government to detect dangerous individuals seeking to reach our territory. In the same vein, I am pleased to announce today that DHS has worked with the State Department to notify all countries in the world of more stringent information sharing requirements to crack down on terrorist travel. Governments who work with us will make the world safer from extremists and while those who fail to comply will face consequences. But these major improvements are not enough. Fanatics have innovated. They have realized terror can be done on the cheap and spread virtually using simple online instructions and household tools. With the rise of ISIS, the phenomena of do-it-yourself mass destruction was born, and Homeland Security hasn't been the same ever since. Two years ago on Halloween, I remember receiving a White House Situation Room report that a truck had driven a mile down a bike path in New York City, mowing down cyclists as it went. Nearly 20 pedestrians were killed or injured before the carnage ended that afternoon. The driver claimed inspiration from ISIS and followed the terror group's instructions to the letter. If you can't join us overseas, stay in your homeland and kill using any means possible. Despite losing territory, the group's reach remains global. Just last week, the FBI arrested a Georgia woman tried to the tide to the United, the United Cyber Caliphate, a hacking and propaganda wing of ISIS. The woman allegedly helped the group promote online kill list featuring US soldiers, government officials, and private citizens. One posting, which included the personal information of potential targets, offered a simple and chilling instruction. Kill them wherever you find them. My department assesses that the primary terrorist threat in the United States continues to be from Islamic militants and those they inspire. But we should not and cannot and must not ignore the real and serious danger posed by domestic terrorists. They are using the same do-it-yourself mass murder tactics as we saw with the horrible assault last week in New Zealand against Muslim worshipers. Attacks on peaceful people in their places of worship are abhorrent. 
Our hearts go out to our friends and allies overseas, and I have offered them DHS's full support. We too have seen the face of such evil with attacks in places such as Charlottesville, Pittsburgh, and Charleston. And in the wake of the New Zealand tragedy, I want to make one thing very clear. We will not permit such hate in the homeland. There is no room in this great nation for violent groups who intimidate or coerce Americans because of their race, religion, sex, or creed. We will counter violent extremists with the full authorities of this department, and we will work with law enforcement partners to bring domestic terrorists to justice. At DHS, we've launched new terrorism prevention programs against all forms of violent hate. We are sharing more information with local authorities. We have worked with social media companies to crack down on terrorist propaganda online, and we have ramped up soft target target security nationwide with a particular focus on protecting schools, large events, major gatherings, and places of worship. As I noted earlier, we need a whole of society approach to turn the tide, which is why in 2019, DHS will host the first ever National Summit on Terrorism Prevention. This two-day event will bring together tech companies, NGOs, community leaders, law enforcement, social service providers, and more in an effort to better crowdsource our defenses against terror. DHS is also focused on amplifying efforts to combat emerging threats. Last year, with the help of Congress, we stood up a new office of countering weapons of mass destruction, one of the biggest ever reorganizations in DHS. This office is set to better protect Americans against chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear dangers. We also fought for and won legislative authority to detect and disrupt dangerous drones so they aren't used on our homeland to spy, to steal, to smuggle, and to cause destruction. In 2019, we will focus on executing these new authorities. The full list of our reforms is much longer, but rest assured, DHS is more committed than ever to keep getting one step ahead of those who would dare to do us harm. We will be vigilant, we will be continuous, and we will address emerging threats. At the same time, we cannot lose sight of our most basic obligations to the American people, reflected in the second goal of our strategic plan, to defend U.S. borders and sovereignty. There is no more fundamental responsibility for a nation. And yet the American people have been let down by our government again and again. I wanna cut through the politics today to tell you loud and clear there is no manufactured crisis at our southern border. There is a real life humanitarian and security catastrophe. Late last year, we were apprehending 50,000 to 60,000 migrants a month. Last month, we apprehended more than 75,000, the highest in over a decade. And today, I can tell you that we are on track to interdict nearly 100,000 migrants this month alone. The situation at our southern border has gone from a crisis to a national emergency to a near system-wide meltdown. I say this with the utmost sincerity and urgency. The system is breaking, and our communities, our law enforcement personnel, and the migrants themselves are paying the price. What's different about the current flow is not just how many people are coming, but who is arriving. Historically, illegal aliens crossing into the United States were predominantly single adult men from Mexico with no legal right to stay. We could detain and remove them within 48 hours. But in recent years, we have seen the volume of vulnerable populations, children's, children and families, skyrocket. Over 60% of the current flow is now families and unaccompanied children, and 60% is non-Mexican. Our system was simply not built to handle this type of flow. 
Because of outdated laws, misguided court decisions, and a massive backlog of cases, we are usually forced to release, release these groups into the United States, and we have virtually no hope of removing them in the future, despite the fact that the vast majority who apply for asylum today do not qualify for it under our laws as determined by a judge. Smugglers and traffickers have caught on, advertising a free ticket into America. As a result, the flow of families and children has become a flood. Cases of fake families are popping up everywhere and children are being used as pawns. In fact, we have uncovered child recycling rings, truly child re-victimization rings, a process by which in innocent child are used multiple times to help migrants gain illegal entry. As a nation, we cannot stand for this. The humanitarian situation cannot be ignored. In one study, more than 30% of women reported being sexually assaulted along the dangerous journey, and 70% of all migrants reported experiencing violence. We give pregnancy tests to girls as young as 10 to ensure we can offer appropriate medical support. Smugglers and traffickers are forcing people into inhumane conditions, demanding extraordinary sums of money and putting lives in danger. They are not humanitarians. They are swindlers, and they are making it harder for us to identify those who actually need our protection. And given the brutal journey and travel conditions, children are arriving at the border sicker than ever before. Make no mistake, though, this is also a security crisis. Criminals are using the situation to line their pockets while gangs are exploiting the loopholes to bring in new recruits. And we are seeing the spread of violent crime and drugs, the majority of which come into our country via the southern border, both at and between ports of entry. What's worse, last year, we identified tens of thousands of convicted and wanted criminals attempting to cross. And those, of course, are just the ones we know about. So what are we doing about it? DHS has built the first border wall to go up in a decade. We are building more and have plans for hundreds of new miles to block illicit goods, illegal entry, and help ensure a safe and orderly migrant flow. We have worked with the Pentagon to deploy thousands of troops to the southern border. We have worked with the Justice Department to prosecute single adults who cross illegally. And we have engaged the Northern Triangle countries to address the challenges at their source. And this month, I am happy to report that we expect to sign a historic first ever regional compact with these nations to counter human and drug trafficking, smuggling and irregular migration. This is something I have been pushing for years and is long overdue. We have also stepped up efforts to protect women and children from being abused, kidnapped, sexually assaulted, and exploited on the journey, and to provide support to survivors. We are doing more to dismantle transnational criminal organizations, and we have intensified operations to seize illegal drugs, especially opioids. I am also looking at ways to help at-risk migrants apply for U.S. asylum from within Central America, rather than embarking on the treacherous track to our border. We must find ways to help vulnerable populations sooner in their journey nor north. But it's simply, my friends and colleagues, just not enough. Our laws are not keeping up with the migrant flows, and until they are fixed, the situation will only get worse and more heartbreaking. We need Congress to stop playing politics and do what's right. We need Congress to change the law to allow us to keep families together throughout the immigration process, to ensure the safe and prompt return of unaccompanied children to their home countries, and to, re and to reverse the court ruling that directs dangerous criminals to be released into our communities. This is a complex and emotional issue, but no matter what side of the aisle you are on, we have common cause to uphold our sovereign responsibility to secure our borders, to facilitate legal trade and travel, to prevent drugs from poisoning our communities, and to help vulnerable populations 
all at the same time. While we wait for Congress to do its job, I must say that I could not be prouder of the men and women of DHS who continue to do theirs with professionalism and compassion. Despite the politically charged atmosphere and the dangers of the job, our agents, officers, and enlisted personnel, whether they are from CBP, ICE, USCIS, Coast Guard, or beyond, have done an extraordinary job staying focused on the mission. They are seizing drugs on the high seas. They are identifying fraudsters applying for visas. They are investigating vast criminal networks across our country in the physical world and on the dark web. They are taking down gun runners, sex slavery rings, and child exploiters. They are helping us welcome more legal immigrants each year than any other nation on earth, and so much more. They all deserve our respect and the thanks of a grateful nation. I ask you to join me in thanking them now. I want to briefly tell you about someone who exemplifies these committed efforts, Homeland Security Investigation Special Agent Alicia McDonald. Just last April, Agent McDonald and her colleagues executed high-risk arrest warrants against gang members tied to the Mexican Mafia. They apprehended individuals linked to at least seven homicides. Because of her meticulous police work, these violent criminals are now off the streets. Epitomizing the dedication of DHS employees, Agent McDonald was eight months pregnant when she led a multi-location search and arrest mission as part of this investigation. And during her three months of maternity leave, she continued to work from home on her own time and on her own volition to ensure these gang members were brought to justice in the courts. Special Agent McDonald is here with us today. I believe I'm hard to see, but I think she's right there you are. Alicia, please stand. You represent the best of DHS, and we thank you for representing all of us so well. On top of my list of threats, uh, that many of you can guess, uh, the word cyber is circled, highlighted, and underlined. The cyber domain is a target, a weapon, and a threat deck vector all at the same time. That is why another goal in our strategic plan is to secure cyberspace and critical infrastructure. Nation states, criminal syndicates, hacktivists, terrorists, they are all building capacity to infiltrate and undermine our networks. They are weaponizing the web. For instance, in the past two years, we witnessed North Korea's WannaCry ransomware spread to more than 150 countries, holding healthcare systems hostage and bringing factories to a halt. And we saw Russia probing our energy grid compromising thousands of routers around the world and unleashing non-Petya malware, which wreaked havoc as one of the costliest cyber incidents in history. I could go on for hours, but what worries me is not what these threat actors have done, but what they have the capability to do. Stealing our most sensitive secrets, deceiving us about our own data, distracting us during a crisis, launching physical attacks on infrastructure with a few keystrokes, or planting false flags to embroil us in conflicts with other nations. The possibilities are limitless, but the time we have to prepare is not. To get ahead of our adversaries, we released the first DHS cybersecurity strategy last May. This was only step one. Step two was partnership. I've said it many times, but it bears repeating. In our hyper-connected world, if we prepare individually, we will fail collectively. So DHS held a first-of-its-kind National Cybersecurity Summit in New York City last summer. We brought together CEOs from some of the largest companies in America, hundreds of senior risk and security officers, multiple cabinet members, and Vice President Pence to take a clear-eyed look at America's cybersecurity posture. The gathering produced real results. Participants took action to deepen partnerships, break down barriers, and better integrate our collective risk management efforts. We announced the formation of the National Risk Management Center, a premier forum for government and industry to collaborate against evolving 
digital dangers. And in the months that followed, we took an even bigger leap. We consolidated and strengthened federal efforts to protect our nation's digital networks. And with congressional authorization, we established the landmark Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency at DHS. We can now retire our jokes about the name of NPPD. CISA was long overdue and will be at the front of the fight in cyberspace for years to come. But strategies, partnerships, and organizational change will still only get us part way. So we've ramped up operations to keep intruders out of our networks. First and foremost, we've driven a change in US policy to replace complacency with consequences. We have made clear we will no longer accept malicious cyber interference. We are fighting back in both seen and unseen ways, including publicly attributing cyber attacks to the perpetrators, levying sanctions, and delivering other consequences. This has sent a powerful message to online adversaries, especially nation states. America has had enough and we will not hesitate to punish you for compromising our networks. We have also instituted a next generation risk management approach to identify and assess critical functions, not only specific assets and systems. We are wielding DHS authorities to get dangerous software, such as Kaspersky branded products, out of federal systems and taking swift action to patch newly discovered vulnerabilities. Alarmingly, our adversaries are using state owned companies as a forward deployed force to attack us from within our own supply chain. So we are working with industry partners to identify and delete these bugs and defects from our systems. But all of the digital threats, the one we take most seriously, are those aimed at the very heart of our democracy. In 2016, at the direction of Vladimir Putin, Russia launched a concerted effort to undermine our elections and our democratic process using cyber-enabled means. Their meddling didn't stop there. They have continued to interfere in our public affairs and have attempted to sow division online among Americans on hot-button issues. Unfortunately, other state nation rivals appear to be following suit and are, in various ways, working to virtually influence U.S. policy and discourse. So let me just send one last message to our cyber adversaries. You cannot hide behind your keyboards and computer screens. We are watching you. And no matter what malware you develop, I promise you, the engines of our democracy are far stronger and far more resilient than any code you can ever write. Last year, we applied our lessons learned from 2016 to prevent hacking in the 2018 elections. It was a full court press. We worked to support all 50 states in a variety of ways, including technical assistance, security assessments, planning exercises, sharing of threat data, incident response, and so much more. On election day, more than 90% of American voters lived in an area covered by our network sensors, vastly more than in 2016, and it worked. And thanks to DHS Cyber Defenders and many partners nationwide, I can say with confidence that 2016 election was the most secure in the modern era. Some of the people who made that happen are with us here today. Matt Masterson and Jeff Hale were road warriors. They spent weeks and months across the country away from their families, building partnerships, and most importantly, establishing trust. By election day, the team had convinced 50 states and 1,400 plus local jurisdictions to join our election security efforts. Matt and Jeff, who I think are also over here, can you please stand? Now we have our eyes on the next election and are launching Protect 
2020, a new initiative designed to get all states to a baseline level of election infrastructure cybersecurity well before the next vote. More broadly, DHS is in the process of bolstering its approach to countering foreign influence to ensure we are prepared to zoom out and see the full scope of adversary attempts to undermine our networks, our nation's critical infrastructure, and our homeland security. But it's not just bad guys we are focused on. Mother Nature has been extremely active too. And when disaster strikes, when a family loses everything, DHS and FEMA are often among the first to lend a helping hand. Our hearts still break for those who've lost loved ones and livelihoods, whether in Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico, the Camp Fire in California, other catastrophic disasters which have affected almost every state in the last two years. We have opened 138 major disasters since the beginning of this administration. To any citizen affecting, affected by these crises, I want to provide assurances that DHS is there for the long haul. We have your backs and you will not be forgotten. We have delivered record-breaking levels of disaster assistance to Americans in the past two years, including putting $7 billion in the hands of disaster survivors, more than the previous decade combined. And in response to recent catastrophes, we are implementing a new vision focused on making America better prepared for the worst. FEMA is investing substantial resources to build more resilient communities. We are forward deploying federal personnel nationwide so they are working side by side with state and local officials well before disaster strikes. And we are expanding alert systems so that we can warn citizens faster and more completely. I've covered only a few areas of our forthcoming strategic plan, but I can assure you in ways large and small, we are undertaking transformation to build DHS for a new age. So whether it's the work we do to stop unfair trade practices, to prevent thieves from compromising our financial systems, to protect our nation's leaders, or to defend our waterways against criminals and foreign powers, DHS is casting aside stagnation for adoption, convention for nimbleness. We are maturing the DHS enterprise to expand unity of effort through joint planning, joint analysis, and joint operations to facilitate everything from hunting down elusive cartel leaders to rescuing wayward migrants. And we are overhauling our support components so that our frontline defenders get what they need more quickly, including timely intelligence to cutting edge technology. I wanna to close today by announcing a major milestone. For many years, since our founding in fact, DHS agencies have operated in temporary spaces in, officer, in offices scattered throughout DC. A re relic of our early days, it's even hard to me, for me to believe when I read this, a relic of our early days when nearly two dozen organizations were merged. This has made it extraordinarily difficult for our 240,000 employees to work together as one team. You may have noticed, however, a large construction project across the river, one of the largest government construction projects, in fact, since the Pentagon. This is the St. Elizabeth campus. And I am pleased to announce this morning that in less than a month, it will serve as the base of operations for a more focused, a more unified, and a more effective and consolidated Department of Homeland Security. When we move next month, we will take stock of all that has changed in the 16 years since DHS was created. And we will take a moment to remember those brave souls whose loss on 9-11 ultimately gave life to a department charged with protecting the American people. You see, the Department of Homeland Security was born from bravery. Our forefathers and mothers are firefighters who rushed into burning buildings. They are first responders who carried victims out of skyscrapers that crumbled around them. 
and they are airline passengers who rushed a cockpit to save the lives of strangers whom they would never know. These are the people who truly founded DHS. And I am proud to say that the men and women that I lead are worthy of this heritage. Many of the successes I discussed this morning and our plans for the future are due to the first class leadership in the department, many of whom are, are sitting in the front row here. Let's give them a quick round of applause. But I think they would agree with me that the real credit belongs to each of the men and women and their families who with honor and integrity stand watch and defend our homeland at the tip of the spear. To all of our employees, I want to say thank you. Like your DHS forebears, you are brave, you are patriots, and you are an inspiration to the entire country. Thank you all again for being here today. May God bless each of you, and may God bless the United States of America. Madam Secretary, thank you. thank you for an awesome overview of the threats uh, the country, the homeland faces and the risks uh, we face and, and what the women and the men of the department are doing to ameliorate the threat and obviously build resilience into our community. Uh, it, it's a, a whole gambit of issues and, and I think uh, the department's role is one of the most difficult uh, in, in, uh, uh, in the United States. But I'd like to start with some of the most recent uh, uh, threats we saw play out in, in New Zealand and use that as also an opportunity to discuss a little more what the department is doing to work with uh, places of faith, uh, since there have also been, uh, obviously, attacks on synagogues in the United States uh, and, and elsewhere. And then maybe a little bit on how important the Five Eyes relationship is from a, a DHS perspective, uh, beyond just the intelligence community, but also from a, a, a security community. And then to add a third twist to that, a little bit of a preview of the terrorism summit you will be hosting uh, later this summer and, and how that all comes together. Uh, you got it in no particular order. <laughs> uh, the relationship with the Five Eyes is strong and important. Uh, I will tell you, interestingly, as time has gone on since I've been secretary, we spend more and more of our time talking about domestic terrorism. Uh, we spend more and more time talking about different threats uh, in the cyber realm, uh, including child exploitation and the very unfortunate new ways that predators can exploit them. Uh, but we also talk about the importance and what it really means of freedom, uh, freedom to gather, freedom to enjoy uh, with friends and family and gathering places, whether that be at church or a sporting, sporting event uh, or at a mosque, as we recently saw. So together we're sharing, uh, we're working on best, best practices. We're working very closely with the private sector to pull down terrorist content from the internet. Uh, and the summit is sort of an expansion of that. The concept there is that whole of society approach that I mentioned. How do we bring everybody together, multidisciplinary, multi-government, every, every different walk of life uh, to understand perspectives to not only prevent radicalization and leanings toward violent extremism, uh, but to perhaps provide off-ramps to find other ways that those who might otherwise choose violence to be able to express themselves. Those partnerships are key, but I hope that everyone will join us. We want to hear uh, from everybody and learn from the different insights and experience. Thank you, Madam Secretary. And I'll use that as a launch pad to, to look at the elections and, and look at uh, some of the lessons we learned from 2018, what that could mean for 2020. And, and you discussed the, the partnership on uh, counterterrorism related efforts in terms of working with social media. How does that play in with uh, foreign interference? Um, and are you seeing countries other than Moscow, uh, Russia, uh, rear their head and, and, and uh, uh, engage themselves in trying to interfere with other elections globally? 
You know, I think the unfortunate downside of uh, the publicity uh, of what the Russians did in 2016 and that we saw in 2018 with respect to foreign interference uh, is that other nation states have now adopted a more visible uh, approach to doing the same. So we see China doing that. We see Iran doing that. Uh, it's interesting. It depends on where you are in the globe, which country uh, is attempting to interfere more. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there's differences there. Uh, but it's a real and pernicious threat. So we're also working with the private sector on that. Uh, but this is an area where education, I think, for citizens is also very important. We have some new initiatives and programs to help Americans become more media savvy. Uh, if you know that your news uh, is from Sputnik, for example, uh, you should think twice because you should know that that has been directed directly from the Kremlin. Uh, and you should put that in perspective as you weigh how you want to interpret and believe it. And I would add RT to that list as well. But looking at that uh, particular set of issues and, and looking that the department is now handling nation state threats in all of its various forms, whether through proxies, and I think you rightfully uh, said in your remarks that they're trying to get inside the supply chain uh, to, to, to influence events. Where do you see the nation state threat uh, today? And in particular, uh, I'd be very curious, the Department of Homeland Security took a very strong position on Kaspersky mm. uh, in terms of not only DHS, but the entire government use of Kaspersky products. What should we be thinking about in terms of 5G? Because when, when I look at the critical infrastructure, that's at the very heart of it all. So if you want to touch on that, and if you want to discuss Huawei and ZT in particular, you're more than welcome to. So <laughs> their charm campaign is on and on, but, but there are some legitimate yeah. risks. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, here's what I would say. The nation states, uh, it, they might have slightly different motives, uh, China and Russia, but they are using a whole of government approach. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, with China, it's not just technological. Uh, their investment that we see throughout the world uh, is cannibalistic in nature, right? I mean, they come in, uh, they offer a cheap loan, uh, they offer opportunity, but the goal of that loan is to hold that country hostage. It's a very different kind of threat than we have seen in the past. When it comes to the technology, though, as I mentioned, you know, they're using companies as a forward deployed force uh, to actually eat away at our security from the inside, from the supply chain. So we have a variety of programs underway. As you know, we have the ICT uh, Supply Chain Task Force. Uh, we're working on a new Federal Acquisition Council. Uh, we're really trying to assess where the risks are and make sure they're known. Mm -hmm. Each individual always has to make their own uh, judgment. Uh, but again, because we do have a weak link uh, in cyber, what we hope to do is to identify these vulnerabilities, take them out whenever we can within DHS authority, but ensure that the average consumer, the average American really understands what they're up against, which is a nation state. Nation state risk. And, and let's use that theme to, to jump to emerging threats. Um, and uh, when we think of some of the new authorities the department has to counter UAS or unmanned aerial uh, vehicles and the like, um, what should we be worried about there? What is the department doing to uh, enhance some of our security uh, uh, protocols and, 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 and measures? And particularly, some lessons learned from maybe the most recent national security special event in, in, with the uh, Super Bowl in, uh, in, in Atlanta, whether or not you saw, got to, to experiment with new technologies, new, new procedures, and, and, and how successful they've been for. Because, I mean, crowded spaces and stadiums, that will always be at the top list of risk and threat, whether right. it's in uh, places of faith or whether it's at rock concerts or whether it's in stadiums. What, what, what should we be thinking about there? You know, I think uh, drones is a great example of where technology itself is not good or bad. Mm -hmm. You know, we use drones in the department as a force multiplier. We use them for disaster response. Uh, we use them to help us understand threats on the southern border. Uh, we use them, many, many states and, and localities use them uh, to help fight fires. 
The flip side, of course, is that a nefarious actor can take a otherwise ubiquitous technology and use it uh, against us. So uh, we see them dropping phones into prisons. We see them smuggling drugs across the border. We see them surveilling, disrupting our technology. Uh, you know, you have seen the use cases out of Asia where drones fly by a multi-storied building, mimic the printer, and suddenly everything you're printing is, goes, you know, is captured by the, the drone. This is a very difficult threat to cover down on because of our open society in the United States. Uh, we're working closely with the FBI and the Defense Department to make sure that we have the technology to address this in a civilian arena. We did uh, try out some new uh, defenses over the Super Bowl. Uh, we did see drones over mm -hmm. the Super Bowl. Mm -hmm. uh, great credit uh, to the city uh, and to the NFL for working, partnering very closely with us. Uh, I think all would say we had a very good uh, effort. Uh, but continuing to understand how that threat is being used and then to develop particular mitigation and countermeasures is important. And to swing back to 5G, I could say the same. Mm -hmm. I mean, we don't yet understand what 5G will be. It's truly a next generation technology. It'll enable on automation, smart cities, uh, capabilities that we cannot yet conceive of. There'll be a huge positive side to that, mm -hmm. but we have to quickly understand the potential vulnerabilities it could introduce. And the attack surface grows exponentially. Absolutely. And, and if you're building a secure system on quicksand, that could be a problem. So uh, I, I, I'll ask one more cyber question, and then I'll get to, to some of the uh, Northern Triangle uh, border questions. But where do you see the department uh, of Homeland Security fitting into the broader deterrent question. And uh, as you know, Madam Secretary, this is a pet rock of mine. So uh, unless there are consequences for bad behavior, you're going to see more and more and more bad behavior. And I think we are starting to levy some consequences in terms of uh, uh, prosecutions and, and uh, indictments and naming and shaming, which I think is very important and limiting uh, people's ability to travel. I sometimes feel like we don't have the offensive coordinator communicating with the defensive coordinator into a head coach kind of role. Where do you see the department fitting into that? And then more broadly speaking, the U.S. government uh, approach to dissuading, deterring, and if need be, compelling bad cyber behavior. So we have to use everything we have. Mm -hmm. uh, because without consequences, there is no deterrence. It's that simple. We all know that. I mean, that's the basis of law enforcement. Mm -hmm. uh, so as you say, we're using financial, we're using diplomatic, uh, we're using any sanction in the toolbox. But at DHS, we will use binding operational directives when needed mm -hmm. to take particular companies or technology out of federal systems. And then we will do all we can to encourage the private sector uh, to do the same. So I think it needs to be coordinated as you described. The good news is we signed, uh, I signed the first ever uh, MOU with the Department of Defense last year with Secretary Mattis. Uh, it has really helped us knit together and leverage each other's capabilities. We analyze the threat together. We're in each other's op centers. Uh, we help bring what the department knows to the private sector uh, as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but should anything happen, we are right there ready to respond with surge forces identified and ready to go. Awesome. And, and I do think the lash up between DHS and DOD is, is actually already yielding some, some positive fruit. So kudos on that. Um, let's go to the Northern Triangle and sort of the, if you can give sort of a, a snapshot or a situation report of what's playing out there in the Western Hemisphere. And, and also, where do you see the threat going from here? Is it going to get worse? Is it going to improve? Uh, and then su uh, subsequently, on the counter-narcotic side, uh, obviously uh, illegal immigration is, uh, is a concern, but on the counter-narcotic side, you've been leaning forward, and I'd be curious to hear what your thoughts are. Yeah, I think we're, what we're trying to do, so on the, the threat side first, uh, we're trying to lean forward on uh, drugs, uh, mm -hmm. on trafficking, on smuggling, and exploitation of all the vulnerable populations. Unfortunately, we see all of that growing, uh, the TCOs and the smugglers are not humanitarians. It's a business, and unfortunately, business is booming. Yeah. So we have to find ways with our partners to just take them down. That involves removing their marketplaces from the dark web. 
Uh, it means eliminating all of the middlemen uh, who provide IDs, travel patterns, uh, information, the actual contraband itself. It's a very decentralized approach these days. We need to not play whack-a-mole, uh, but take down the entire network. The Northern Triangle countries are uh, willing to help. They see the threat perhaps more in a more pronounced way than we do. Uh, whenever I speak to them, the two main things that they raise, one are what they refer to as extra continentals. Uh, we might refer to them as special interest aliens, but those who have mm -hmm. patterns uh, that are travel patterns that are suspicious or like that of a terrorist. Uh, they're from the Middle East, they're from Africa. Uh, to the Northern Triangle countries, it does not make sense why they would be traveling to a country in South America and then traveling all the way up Central America for the purposes of quote unquote seeking asylum. So it's very concerning uh, to them. So we're working very closely with them and will through this compact to share information so that we all know who's traveling. Uh, and hopefully understand what their intent is. But the other half is the humanitarian side, uh, the focus in particular for them being on children. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, as many, all three of the governments have said, uh, they want their children back. They want to welcome their children home to their families and their communities. But the law, if you are a non-Mexican child, uh, does not allow the Department of Homeland Security to send the children home. We have to keep them in the U.S., put them in HHS care, and then HHS does the yeoman work of providing a suitable and safe sponsor. But the countries themselves want their young to come back and build their countries. Uh, so they've asked us to change our laws to help uh, so that we do not put children at risk. So, Madam Secretary, I think we have time for another question, and I'd be curious uh, in terms of some of the cooperation with the private sector from a critical infrastructure perspective. And you mentioned the new National Risk Management Center, the NRMC, um, and I think the focus on lifeline sectors is, is, is a very smart way to go. Uh, not to suggest that everything, uh, if everything's critical, nothing is, but the reality is they're all very important. But some truly from a public safety, national security, uh, uh, and economic security perspective are, are more critical than others. So I'd be curious where you see that going, uh, and, and ultimately they're on the front lines of this war. And, and uh, um, in addition to sharing more information, do you see more combined cooperation between some of the most critical infrastructure owner operators in the department? And I think CISA, is also yielding some fruit now that uh, uh, it's more than just a name change, it's more than just branding. Um, and I'd be curious where you see all that going. And uh, I mean, you've had a, you come to this, to the job with amazing expertise on the cyber side. So what, what surprised you on that side? Uh, uh, right? I just, we need to, we need to do more, mm -hmm. right? We need to take it to the next level. So I think we've been through the let's partner. Mm -hmm. uh, we've been yeah, through yeah. the uh, let's share information. Mm -hmm. uh, we even have built in the, here are some countermeasures and way to mitigate against uh, the vulnerability and threat information that we're providing you. Uh, but now we need to operationalize those partnerships. And what I mean by that is stand shoulder to shoulder, and not just in response, uh, which we often do in many of our mission sets, but on the front end. Mm -hmm. So, you know, FEMA is putting people into the field. Uh, the PSAs are in the field. We have cybersecurity advisors going into the field. Uh, TSA, Coast Guard, I mean, most of our components already have substantial presence throughout the United States and the world. We have 2,000 uh, DHS folks deployed around the world. But we need to be with them to understand what our partners need best. It needs to be requirements driven. Uh, and the best way to partner is left of boom, right? How do we prevent? How do we assess? How do we identify? And I, I do believe that they also, sometimes faster than we, can identify the emerging threats that are coming at us, Absolutely. right? This is what's emerging from a technological perspective. Again, this is how we can use mm -hmm. it in a force multiplier way. Mm -hmm. But here are the security vulnerabilities that it opens up. So how do we build that in? The other part are just citizens. You know, in this in this day and age, every citizen is on the front line. It's so much more than hurricane proofing your house and sandbagging. 
Uh, you now have to think about how you use your data and how it's stored. Don't fall for a phishing attack. Figure out where your media is coming from. Just so a vast majority of breaches start with phishing and whaling. Yeah, I mean, they 80%. do. And they're more and more sophisticated, as you yeah. know. I mean, yeah. the adversaries use artificial intelligence to make sure that that email that gets sent to you looks just like an email your daughter might yeah. send. Yeah. Right? So you're that yeah. much more likely yeah. to click on it before mm -hmm. you realize that something is amiss. And, and since we have, I see the tyranny of time gives me two more minutes. So I, I'd be curious on the on the FEMA front. Yeah. And uh, I, I mean, obviously, you've seen a rash of devastating uh, 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 events, including on Auburn's campus itself. And General Burgess, who uh, welcomed you, his home was yeah. one of those. Uh, fortunately, everyone was safe, but many others not so. Where do you see FEMA uh, retooling uh, themselves and, and, and uh, uh, where you see the disaster management and resilience? You talk about strategic resilience. I'd be curious what that looks like because we can't prevent every, it certainly can't prevent Mother Nature, but we can build more resi resilient communities, families, uh, and individuals. So I'd be curious where you see that going. No, I think uh, I think what FEMA has been doing, and great uh, kudos to um, Administrator Long, uh, to uh, to Pete. Now, mm -hmm. uh, you know the vision is very strong within FEMA, and it's really about how can we prepare citizens, how can we make them resilient? Mm -hmm. uh, and that's a very different way of thinking about just response, right? Just after the catastrophe, yep. how can DHS and FEMA effectively respond? We, we do that, we do that quite well, mm -hmm. but it's pushing it all left. So how can we help better prepare uh, to prevent, to mitigate? How can we think about the assistance, the tools, the training uh, to ensure that that is also pushed to the left? Even when you think of school safety, uh, which FEMA along with much of the department has a role in. Uh, it's giving tools to those who work in a school environment to not just be able to understand different uh, options for hardening the building, uh, but first aid techniques, mm -hmm. you know, stop mm -hmm. the bleed. Uh, let's train people who we know will actually be first responders uh, so that they're better help able uh, to help their neighbors. So resilience is, is comprehensive. It's not just one thing. Uh, it's thinking through raising that baseline. You know, we're all about raising baselines at DHS. Uh, but security and resilience to ensure that you have, have you opted into the alert and warnings in your environment? Do you know what local officials to listen to in an emergency? Do you know what threats are likely to occur in your area? You know, get smart, spend the time, be ready. And very last question on the aviation side, and, and you're a very original plank holder of what pre-Department of Homeland Security actually, even at, at TSA. Where do you see the aviation threat going? And, and more importantly, looking ahead, what uh, TSA may be uh, 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 doing to try to, to try to stay, again, left the boom, but also technology changes, human nature remains consistent, uh, uh, understanding where some of these pieces come together. You know, TSA, I have so many uh, components like this, <laughs> but TSA is one of those components that, because uh, they do their jobs so well, they're often not recognized for it, meaning uh, so. they have done so much to enhance security over the last two years. It really to, is night and day. For yeah, the start but the to meet the emerging threats, and not just within the United States, uh, but the partnership and the effort that has gone into ensuring that those security enhancements are shared throughout the world uh, has been astonishing. A lot of modeling, a lot of R&D, a lot of understanding the new threats as they evolve. Uh, as you know, uh, we're deploying more and more CT, advice, C CT devices. Um, computed tomography is truly next gen. It's 3D, you can turn the image around, you can really understand what you're looking at. Insider threat, dogs, uh, really thinking through who's traveling. We got good dogs at Auburn. Yeah, no, the Bake dogs are dogs. great. Everyone loves the dogs. <laughs> Madam Secretary, thank you for a, a phenomenal overview of what keeps you up at night. And the rest of us can sleep a little better since you're on, uh, on the job, on the ball. Uh, we at Auburn University, I think, have uh, 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 an opportunity, but more importantly, a responsibility to contribute to our national security, to contribute to our homeland security, stand ready to help in whatever way we can. Madam Secretary, thank you. Thank, thank you, you for your leadership, always. and thank, thank you. you for joining us today. No, thank you. My pleasure.